Hello. Okay, so we're going to start another unit. This one is about ancient Greece. So in our last unit, we were talking about the prehistoric uh, Aegean, which is where a lot of the um, origins from some of the myths and some of the cultural aspects of what's important to the ancient Greeks originate and come from. So that's kind of like ancient Greece before it was ancient Greece, basically the prehistoric phase. Um, so now we're going to talk about ancient Greece itself. Okay, there's a ton to cover in here, so I'm going to break this up into quite a few little, like, smaller grouped lectures. First of all, um, hang on. what do you know about ancient Greece? I feel like this is one of the areas when I go into Egypt, ancient Greece, and Rome, particularly, where my students have some pre existing knowledge because there's such a presence of ancient Greek work in our pop culture today. So um, my kids really liked the Percy Jackson books. Um, my older kid was actually Luke in the uh, play version of Percy Jackson here in town uh, uh, last year. So um, things like Percy Jackson, which if you're not familiar, no big deal. Um, it's a contemporary series of young adult um, books that incorporate a lot of Greek mythology into the storytelling and into the characters, which is kind of cool. There's also things like Clash of the Titans. There's um, several video games that incorporate ancient Greek kind of ideas. There's the Marvel movie, The Eternals, which I mentioned when we were talking about Babylon and things like this, because it incorporates a lot of um, kind of references to the ancient world in general. Um, so, um, Angelina Jolie's character's name is Thena, which is a take on Athena, who's one of the goddesses who we'll talk about in a minute. Anyway, lots of um, presence of references to uh, classical culture, uh, which is like ancient Greece and, and ancient Rome, the Roman Empire, right? That's what makes it classical culture in uh, pop culture today. So maybe you know some things. Usually when I ask people this in a seated class and they start listing things, one of the things people say are like marble sculptures, like white marble naked people sculptures, right? That's one of the things that, that people tend to think of. Temples with all the columns, lots of columns being kind of a Greek thing. Uh, several people know some of the gods and goddesses like Zeus, for example, is a pretty well-known guy. Um, so that kind of stuff. So my point being, you probably know some things about ancient Greece already. So we're going to go into some of that in some more detail. Um, first of all, let's orient ourselves on a map. This one's from National Geographic. It's a good place to get maps. Uh, so when we're looking at ancient Greece, and we're going to start a little earlier than this actually, but 750 BC, this is kind of what we're talking about. So here's the Greek mainland. Then we have all the islands that we were already talking about. So like Crete, the Cycladic Islands, all that stuff is all kind of part of this. Troy, you can see on your map, which is actually over in Turkey, right? Uh, we have Sparta. Sparta's a pretty uh, known thing. My middle school and elementary, we were the Spartans. That was our mascot. Uh, the movie 300, which is based on a graphic novel, came out a few years ago. That's the Spartans are, are Greek people. Athens, right, the capital of Greece. Mount Olympus, where the gods and goddesses live. So you probably have heard of some of these things. You could probably find this on a map, right? We're in Europe, we're next to the Aegean Sea, we're kind of on the Mediterranean. Okay, so that gives us a little idea about where we're at. A couple of things just to start off with. Um, I occasionally will slip a little bit of uh, Greek lettering in here. I did take Greek in college, which is not super practical, but neither was anything I took in college. So there you go. Uh, so this is kind of an embarrassing thing. I didn't realize Mount Olympus was an actual place, like not a mythic place, um, until I was in college, which was a long time ago. <laughs> but um, still, I thought Mount Olympus was like a made up like place in the sky where the gods and goddesses lived. I didn't know it was an actual mountain until I was like, you know, 19 or something and in college. So I'm here to tell you, Mount Olympus is a real place. <laughs> you can visit it, you can go to it. It is in uh, Greece, it is the highest mountain in Greece. The ancient Greeks believed that many of their gods and goddesses lived there, and that's kind of how they organized them, like the Olympian gods and goddesses and the people who, the gods and goddesses who weren't on Mount Olympus. So it is a real place, it does exist. That is a picture of that highest mountain right there. It kind of looks a little bit to me like Half Dome, which if you're familiar with our national parks and stuff, that's at Yosemite in California. Anyway, 
Mount Olympus is real. <laughs> okay. So what I'd like to do in this introduction is just give you like kind of the crash course on some of the gods and goddesses. Um, we are going to look at art that features them in ancient Greece and then the related uh, Roman gods and goddesses are pretty much the same people but with different names. So parenthetically next to all of these I have their Roman name as well because after we do Greece we'll talk about the Etruscans and the Romans and there's a lot of overlap uh, in terms of a lot of things but their their um, mythology certainly. Okay so first off, we have Zeus. His Roman name is Jupiter. He's the king of the gods, right? So he's kind of the boss guy. And um, he rules the sky. The sky is his domain. His attribute, his symbol is a thunder, is a lightning bolt, okay? So oftentimes he has a lightning bolt. Sometimes he's also shown with an eagle. So that's kind of his symbol as well. And sometimes he has just like an, a staff. He has a big beard all the time, but so do his two brothers, who I'll talk about in a minute. So if you're trying to distinguish them, the best way to distinguish them is to look at what else is with them, look at their context. Uh, Zeus's wife is Hera. Her Roman name is Juno, and um, she is Zeus's wife. She's also Zeus's sister, kind of like with the Egyptians. There's gross ancestral stuff with these gods and goddesses as well. I don't know why that's such a thing in the ancient world, but it is. Um, so she is Zeus's wife. Um, she's the goddess of marriage, which I've always thought was sort of a mockery because if you know anything about mythology, you know that Zeus cheated on her constantly. Okay, so Hera. Hera is a little bit hard to, to pick out. Usually there'll be some kind of context clue telling you that this is Hera, but she doesn't have like a set symbol like, uh, like Zeus does. Okay. Then we have Poseidon, his Roman name is Neptune, and he is one of Zeus's two brothers. So Poseidon is his brother. You'll notice they look kind of similar. Check him out and look at Zeus. Very similar, big beards, right? Uh, kind of ripped even though they're old and have big beards. Um, so Poseidon generally always has a trident. That's like his staff that has the three points on it. Looks kind of like a pitchfork. That is a trident. And um, that is, is his attribute. So if he has a trident and a beard, it's Poseidon. Um, he's also sometimes portrayed, like in this mosaic, riding on his chariot with his hippocampus. So his hip hippocampuses are um, half horse, half uh, whale-like creatures. They have like, like horse fish, kind of. And they pull his chariot. So if you see a guy with a beard riding around on these fish horse hybrid things, that's Poseidon. If he's holding a trident, definitely Poseidon. Okay. Uh, then we have Hestia, whose uh, Roman name is Vesta, and Demeter, whose Roman name is Ceres. So Hestia is the sister of, of uh, Hera and Poseidon and Zeus, um, and their other brother Hades. And um, she is the goddess of the hearth. So the significant thing about Hestia is uh, when archeologists are digging up different sites and looking at Roman homes, which are called domus, by the way, um, under the hearthstone, that's where the fireplace is, there's little statues often of, of a woman and that's Hestia because the idea was that it would bring good fortune and protect you in your house if you had a statue of Hestia buried under your hearthstone. Um, she is really easy to mistake for Hera. Neither of them have really subscribed consistent attributes, so um, you kind of have to look at who they're hanging out with and what the context for the statue is. Demeter is the sister of all of these people we've already mentioned, and she's the goddess of grain and architect uh, architecture, excuse me, grain and agriculture. So sometimes she is holding the thing that she's holding here, which is a cornucopia, so this like conical baskety thing with fruit and vegetables and stuff coming out of it and sometimes she just has like a big bushel of wheat okay and so she's very important to um, like the harvest time okay uh, and she is also the mother of Persephone who is someone we're going to learn about in a minute so all of these people so far all live on Mount Olympus that's their kind of home base okay let's look at the next person this is probably my favorite of the gods and goddesses. This is Athena. So um, Athena is, uh, her Roman name is Minerva, 
and she's the goddess of wisdom and warfare. So warfare, but like the strategy part of warfare. She almost always has a shield, sometimes a spear, sometimes a sword. She's usually wearing this kind of um, warrior helmet that she's wearing here. Sometimes she has some armor, armor over her toga. Um, she also sometimes has an owl, okay? And she is the uh, daughter of Zeus, but kind of daughter, like in a different way than, than normally you get daughters. She sprang out of her father's head, fully formed. So she doesn't have a mother. She just came from Zeus's brain. And because of that, she's also known as uh, Parthenos, which um, is the word for, for virgin, basically. So she, because she wasn't conceived, um, sexually, like children usually are, she's kind of a symbol of uh, virginity and chastity as well. Okay, Ares. This is uh, her brother, who is also the son of Zeus. He's the son of Zeus and Hera. So he is the only one of the um, gods who has both Zeus and Hera for, uh, for parents, I think. I might be lying to you. We'll see when I get further along in my notes if anybody else comes up. But um, Ares is, is their kid. Uh, and he's the god of war, but not like just the strategy part, like his sister Athena. He's the god of war, like uh, warfare, like brutality and fighting and battles. Um, he is the father of Romulus and Remus. If those names are familiar, um, that's good. If they're not, that's okay. We'll learn about them when we talk about Rome. They're the founders of Rome, okay? And he's the lover of Aphrodite, okay? So who's Aphrodite? Well, this is Aphrodite. Her uh, Roman name is Venus, and this is uh, Hephaestus. His Roman name is Vulcan. So, um, Let's see, Aphrodite is also a daughter of Zeus, meaning she and Ares are brother and sister and lovers, which is weird, but that's like a thing with the gods and goddesses. Uh, and she's the daughter of Zeus and Dione, who is, um, I think like a, a nymph of some kind. So she's um, mythological, but she's not quite a goddess stat statue, right? And uh, Aphrodite is the goddess of love and beauty. She was born from sea foam, so she sometimes you see her portrayed as like coming out of the ocean on the waves or like uh, rising up from the ocean on a shell. She's the mother of Eros, um, who she has that child with Ares, her brother, who's also her lover. Um, and we'll look at Eros a little more in a second. But her husband is um, Hephaestus. So Aphrodite's with Hephaestus. He's the god of fire and metal working. He's the son of Zeus and Hera. Oh, excuse me, Ares and Hephaestus are both the sons of Zeus and Hera. Um, so his wife's sister cheats on him with his brother, which is awkward in lots of ways. Um, he makes Zeus's scepter, his staff thing. He also made Poseidon's trident. Um, he also helps um, Athena be born from her father's head. Uh, he is kind of discussed in, in classical literature and mythology as being ugly and lame, which is mean, um, and is why uh, his wife is constantly cheating on him with her brother, which is gross. Okay, then we have Apollo. Apollo is the only one whose name is the same in uh, Greek and Roman, and it's also the same in Etruscan, so his name stays pretty consistent. So we have Apollo and uh, Artemis, whose Roman name is Diana. They are brother and sister, but they're not gross about it. So Apollo is the god of light and music. He's also associated with, with the sun, particularly the sunrise, and also healing. Um, he, he kind of covers a lot of ground. He's the son of Zeus and uh, Leto, who is, she's the daughter of one of the Titans. Um, his epithet, which is his descriptive phrase expressing, you know, what he's like, his characteristics and stuff, um, is phoibos, uh, P-H-O-I-B-O-S, which means radiant, but like literally related to light. So he kind of glowed with the light of the sun as part of his thing. Um, he's identified with the sun, which uh, is, has its own uh, separate guy, which is Helios, or Sol, depending on if you're Greek or Roman. So they're kind of conflated a lot in artworks. 
He's the father of Cersei, which uh, is, a, is another goddess that comes up uh, in the Odyssey. Okay, Artemis, or Diana, is his sister. They are twins, and uh, she is the goddess of the hunt and wild animals and also the moon. So she is almost always portrayed with a bow and arrow or sometimes just a bow. Uh, often she'll have like a stag, like a deer or something with her. Sometimes she has the moon with her. Um, but she is often shown as like in the act of hunting. Uh, and uh, Apollo sometimes has a harp. Okay. Okay, Hermes, whose Roman name is Mercury. He's the son of Zeus and one of the nymphs. I don't remember which one. He's the messenger of the gods. Um, he is seen as a guide to travelers, including the dead. He's affiliated with um, like your, your path to uh, the underworld as well. And he carries a herald's rod, that's that thing that he's carrying in this image, and he wore a winged hat and winged shoes, or sometimes he just has wings sprouting from his ankles. Okay, and so those are all uh, Olympian gods and goddesses. They, they tend to, to, their home base kind of is Mount Olympus, though um, Hermes, you know, travels a lot because he's the messenger guy. Other non-Olympian gods, we have um, Hades, whose Roman name is Pluto. He is Poseidon and Zeus's third brother, and he's the lord of the underworld. So Zeus has the sky, Poseidon has the sea, Hades has the underworld. He also has a big beard, big curly beard like them, um, but he is portrayed, sometimes uh, he has this thing that he's holding, which is his, um, it's like a staff, but it has two spikes instead of the three, like the trident. Sometimes he has his three-headed dog. Um, often he has a crown because he's the king of the dead. He's the lord of the dead, the king of the underworld. Uh, and then he is portrayed with his wife, Persephone, whose uh, Roman name is Corey. Um, and she has to spend half of her time in the underworld with him. So she is the daughter of Demeter. And... Um, She's affiliated with um, like uh, springtime, basically. She's the queen of the underworld when she's in the underworld with uh, Hades, but she's kind of the embodiment of spring and green crops and when things are blooming. Um, so she doesn't like being in the underworld, okay? So he, he kidnapped her and um, she tried not to eat or drink anything while she was in the underworld, but she ate six. Um, seeds of a pomegranate and because of that for six months of the year she has to be there and that's why there are seasons because in the fall and winter she's in the underworld so nothing can bloom. You get it. Okay. Uh, some other gods that I like to include that pop up in some of the uh, work that we look at. Dionysus whose uh, Roman name is Bacchus. He's the son of Zeus and a mortal and he's the god of wine and wild things and partying. So he often has grape leaves. He usually has like a crown of grape leaves. He's kind of, he's often like in recline, like lounging about eating grapes and drinking wine and stuff like this. Um, we have Eros, who is, uh, his Roman name is Cupid. He's sometimes portrayed as a little baby with wings. And then sometimes he's kind of an adolescent like this with wings. He pretty much always has wings. He often has a bow and arrow. He is often portrayed with his mother, Aphrodite. They're usually, they're often portrayed uh, together. And he is the, the god of love, uh, like his mom is the goddess of love, basically. Uh, and then the middle guy I include because I think he's kind of an interesting figure. So his name is Asclepios, which is hard for me to say. And his Roman name is also difficult. It's um, Eschlapias. And he's the son of Apollo and a mortal. So remember how Apollo is also affiliated with healing? Okay, so this is his son and he is um, more, like that aspect of Apollo is really strengthened in him. So he is the god of healing and his symbol is a serpent entwined staff. If that sounds familiar, it's because that is our emblem of modern medicine, which makes sense because this is the god of healing. So I like to include him to show kind of how that relates to the contemporary world. Okay, 
another thing, I just want to talk about a few other things related to Greece, and then I'll stop this little intro lecture and we'll get into um, the art itself. So one of the things that um, is important to Greek culture is humans as the measure of all things. So they're very interested in kind of the math behind aesthetics. Aesthetics being the study of what is beautiful and pleasing to the eye, right? So everything is kind of on a human scale and that scale is very important. Proportions are very important. Ratios are very important. And it all kind of revolves around the human experience and humans being sort of the way to measure everything, okay? Um, they invented democracy, kind of, I put it in quotes, uh, which um, is a Greek word, which means rule by demos, demos, D-E-M-O-S, means the people, rule by the people. I put it in quotes because they had a senate, but it was only um, men who were of a certain age and owned land, so it's this very, like, not really equal kind of situation, but it, it's different than having just like a straight up king or something. It's not a monarchy. So they, they did a democracy, but you know, put a little asterisk next to that in history. Um, they also had lots of groundbreaking contributions to art, literature, philosophy, and mathematics. Um, so we have people like Socrates, Sappho, Sophocles, Plato, Euripides, all these really famous, important thinkers. Um, Greeks are self-identified as Hellenes, H-E-L-L-E-N-E-S, uh, -E -E and uh, kind of they come from the intermingling of Ege people from the Aegean and Indo-European people who established city-states, which are called uh, polis, P-O-L-E-I-S, or for singular polis, uh, P-O-L-I-S. Um, so we have the Dorians of the north who settled in uh, Peloponnesos and the Ionians who settled in Asia Minor, and this is where, uh, who eventually become the Greeks, kind of come from. So in 776 BC, all the separate Greek-speaking city-states, polis, as I said, held their first common athletic games at Olympia, which is a sanctuary uh, dedicated to Zeus. And from then on, despite various rivalries and sometimes fighting, lots of infighting, the Greeks kind of regard themselves as citizens of Helas, H-E-L-L-A-S, um, they're joined together by a common culture and language distinct from the barbarians, which is what they called literally everyone else in the world. Okay, so this is where we get the beginnings of uh, the Greeks as a, as a uniform identity, even though they're still kind of in city-states. All right, so in the next lecture, we'll get into the first period of art in ancient Greece.